throughout this video, I'd like us to be asking, what happens to men? What happens to men like, say, my father, who wasn't equipped to be a father or a husband, just like his father before him? And what chain of events lead to a long-lasting generational trauma and become a struggle for men to connect with their families. And this isn't a fed up dig at men full of contempt or judgment. Let's just simply look at what makes our fathers our fathers from a place of child development and intimacy. And there are many different ways that men find themselves where they are in their interpersonal life. And a really good example to look at is the perpetually fascinating historical figure, John Quincy Adams, who is the sixth president of the United States the son of John Adams, who was the second president of the United States. So let's look at what happened to John Quincy. He was born in 1767 and died in 1848. And let's start with a really wacky hypothetical that, imagine that I had a time machine and I was a therapist and the only therapist in St. Petersburg, Russia, and it's 1812, where John Quincy Adams is the plenipotentiary minister from the United States to Russia, and he's there assigned by James Madison for six years of diplomatic work with the Russian court and the czar there. It's a miserable six years for him. And me, conveniently being the only American therapist in town, the only therapist, I guess, um, the sixth president-to-be of the United States, John Quincy, to see me, he comes to see me during a deeply sad personal crisis. I got the time machine. That's why I'm in St. Petersburg, Russia. He's there for his diplomatic work. And when he comes to see me, he is halfway through the most terrible six years of his life in Russia. And his diplomatic position gives him, and like sort of to get a gauge on the power, is like he has full authority to represent the United States with the Russian court there. And let's not get bogged down in how people didn't seek out a therapist back then since psychotherapy sessions, as we wouldn't, as we know it, probably wouldn't start really for like another hundred years. Carl Jung wouldn't be born until 1875, 60 years from this point. And John Quincy would have kept his crisis most likely to himself. And historically, that's what he usually did. So let's say it's September 16th, 1812, when John Quincy made an appointment with me for a session together. And I would ask John Quincy Adams what he needs help with specifically. And he would explain to me that he and his wife, Louisa, just lost their one-year-old daughter, also named Louisa, the day before the session to dysentery. The baby girl brought a huge spark of joy to this couple in a very dark and stressed time period in their marriage and their life. He can't sleep, you know, appropriately. He's devastated. He's worried about his wife. He's falling into an appropriate depression, but also he's very prone to doubts of depression and he wants to retreat into himself, into his work, but he can't. Work is the thing that usually keeps this man going and sort of sane in his life. In addition, he might tell me that his marriage is stressed for the majority of their marriage, which we'll come back to later. In addition to that, around this time period of that life-breaking loss, Napoleon Bonaparte had taken Moscow two days prior on September 14th, 1812, and Moscow was set on fire in defiance. It's still on fire when he has this therapy session with me and Napoleon had been eating up Europe um, and is now just 400 miles away from he and Louisa in his life. This is greatly affecting the safety of his wife, his son Charles, who's with them, an entourage of his helpers in his diplomatic work in St. Petersburg. And getting out of there in that era would be a horrific travel experience. So, like, think about the Oregon Trail. If you if you remember playing that game when you were a kid, it just got nothing on this kind of travel from St. Petersburg to safety in England or France. Maybe not England around the time. So, John Quincy's wife would actually heroically make this journey that I'm speaking of by herself with her toddler son, Charles, alone in 185, which is three years later. And we're going to come back to that, like, profoundly mind-blowing experience. So everyone in St. Petersburg, Russia would be feeling some terror on what was to come next from Napoleon. And ironically, Napoleon's army doesn't survive the coming winter. Remember, it's September. And because the Russian used that winter to their advantage in expelling Napoleon from their country. So back to our session. In our session, John Quincy would go on to tell me that his wife now suffers from poor health, or she's always suffered from poor health, but she's now experiencing suicidality based on grief, and she just wants to join her infant daughter in, in the afterlife. And there are other pieces contributing to her grief surrounding her children that we're going to get to later, like the focus of the video, really. 
To add to that horrible year for John Quincy Adams in 1812, he most likely heard via letters just two months prior that the U.S. is now at war with Britain, think of the War of 1812, and again, starting just around June, and it would take about two to three months for letters to get to him with that knowledge. And he had been working to prevent that war for years surrounding the issues of impressing sailors, global maritime powers in Britain. And Britain being Britain was like sort of the factors in that war. Earlier in the year of 1812, his beloved older sister, Abigail, also known as Nabby to the family, named after Abigail Adams, the mother, um, and he has seen very little of his sister since the age of 11, which we'll come back to, she had a mastectomy the year prior in Quincy, Massachusetts. She would pass away about 11 months from where the session started with John Quincy Adams, and he would lose his sister many times over from the period of his life with the family being a diplomatic family and travel, global travel, at a at a hard era in, in, in global history to, to travel. So these are the little windows for me about this man's childhood and development and family life that I would kind of keep in my mind in this first session with somebody. And in our first session, I would gather that the man has been in survival mode his whole life, and I'm not wrong about that. That's not just about living in the early 1800s, which was just a brutal experience and traumatic for anyone, but it also goes deeper than that. So it's September. Winter is coming. The brutal winter in St. Petersburg like nips at your consciousness. And like I mentioned, it's what almost did Napoleon in in that, in that year. The winter greatly affects his wife and health and everybody's health, really. So, and John Quincy Adams is caught in that his major lifelong trauma coping mechanism, his strategy, which is to work and retreating into himself from the loss of his infant daughter, isn't working and the grief is hitting him in an intense way. So I would be wondering if his work would get in the way of him becoming vulnerable with me as sessions would progress. He, he doesn't know what to do with himself or his emotions. So some present issues in his life. His work in St. Petersburg is to draw an alliance between Russia via the Tsar Alexander there and the U.S. as allies in economic support of each other against the complicated maritime trade or aggression between Britain and France. I may have butchered that. It's it's kind of a complicated thing. So in my St. Petersburg therapy office, I imagine the 45-year-old John Quincy, who's actually the age that I am now, would be visibly and profoundly depressed given his loss more, more than his usual dysthymic kind of depression that he would struggle with his whole life. Dysthymic meaning like a depression at baseline. He's extremely well-spoken to describe him a little bit, probably to a fault. He's very cerebral. He's not very connecting as a patient. He's a gentleman, but doesn't need much connection with you. Um, and as our grief sessions would progress outside of the context of the loss of his daughter, I imagine he might be a hard patient to make an intimate heart connection with in person. And perhaps that's the whole point to this podcast. And if I try to get him to release some of his grief, he might offer me like a quote on suffering from Shakespeare or something like that. This would be an intellectual way to like talk about feelings, but not express them with me. Like many childhood trauma survivors, he's most likely be thinking about his feelings versus experiencing them due to not being fully in his body. He's extremely accomplished. He's well-read and he's often described as cold and aloof, especially by his wife and those who, you know, in his family, even those that, especially those that he worked with in government. And um, he would most likely present to me in this session as kind of all business. He comes from this Puritan staunch New England kind of stoic roots. And like his father, he struggles with getting out of his own way with people. He's not very good with them despite these amazing accomplishments and eloquence and intellect, which is gonna be a generational theme. He rubs people the wrong way. And I'd sense he's not likely fully in his emotional body, detached from his needs, and duty to commitment to work keeps his wolves at bay to describe him a little bit. I'd also be noticing an escapist quality to his work with an inner narrative of duty to country and extreme self-discipline to a neurotic level. And I'd wonder if he is someone who is focused on issues and ideas, not people, and not people especially whom he's connected with. 
And if I inquire with John Quincy Adams, how he manages his emotions, he tell me that he writes daily in a diary, a lifelong habit that he would have, which is a gift because we have access to that diary. Um, and he would do that in solitude, which always worked for him. And this would probably make me feel sad for him as a therapist. And as our sessions would progress, John Quincy Adams would tell me about his early life and how he got into government diplomacy and politics through um, what I would call his, his trauma story, essentially. From the age of 11 till approximately 18, he worked and studied in European diplomacy as a, first as a secretary for his father while in France during the Revolutionary War, and in addition to briefly being placed in a French boarding school, which he actually enjoyed that, and then later apprentice at the age of 14 to a fellow New Englander founding father, Francis Dana. He, is, he was the first minister to Russia from the U.S., so this isn't John Quincy's first rodeo here. He's been a rock star diplomat from the age of about like 12 or 14. He could speak French. He absorbed it at a very young age. He studied the classic at his father's suggestion, classic antiquity, um, and conversed with adults like an accomplished, you know, well-educated adult at a young age. So as a side note, just to put into the, all that into perspective of the times, at 14, I was getting C's and D's in social studies, and I just discovered pot, and I played in a Guns N' Roses cover band, and wasn't quoting the Roman philosopher Cicero or absorbing French so well that he could teach adults that, and he did. I was quoting like Fire Marshal Bill from In Living Color, and I had just dropped out of the Boy Scouts for uh, for just a little bit of an insight to what how different boys are raised in different eras. So one could argue that there was no childhood for John Quincy Adams. And I do want to point out some things about the time as to make sure this doesn't feel like I'm overly holding him by ridiculous standards in our modern life. So some things about the early 1800s. Life expectancy was around 55 years of age. Antibiotics wouldn't be in use for another 100 years or so. Children in the U.S. in the early 1800s were working by the age of 10 in hard labor. 46% of children at that time did not make it to their fifth birthday due to illness and all kinds of things. As an adult, John Quincy, who would suffer from like eye infections, he would be treated with leeches around that time. His wife was bloodlet frequently through her illnesses. Um, and life for the majority of people in the West was focused around survival, reputation, and a daily interaction with God. Many people were illiterate, and life was really brutal compared to our modern life. So back to our session. He told me more about himself. He's the father of three boys. Only his youngest, Charles, um, is with him and his wife in Russia. Um, and the older two are left with the grandparents and family back in Massachusetts. Let's really make a note about that, because I'm going to be coming back to that as the focus of this video. Everything about him and his generational trauma and his family. So more about him. He's a Harvard graduate at the age of 20 when he came back at the age of 18. Um, he is a tireless lawyer on the North Shore of Massachusetts and, for, uh, and around Boston for about three years before he got into politics when he returned from Europe again at the age of 18. Um, he spoke several languages. Um, one return trip with his father back to the U.S. from France. You know, John Adams proudly noted that his son could teach French diplomats English in perfect French. Um, he was also a diplomatic minister to the Netherlands, appointed by George Washington. He was a minister to Berlin and recalled by his father after his father lost his second term election. He was a state senator, which quickly led to a seat as a federal senator. Um, he was senator in the federal government for a term, and he resigned due to party switching against tensions with Britain. That's due to a lot of his sticking to principles, which is a theme in this family. His father is a founding father. Second president, his mother is considered the most significant first lady in our history and one of the first advocates for women's rights. Um, he comes from a well-known, yet not super nationally popular political family, given the U.S. is very much pro-slavery and they're an abolitionist family. So as a tween, he hung out with the likes of Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson with a sad, tragic twist to the family about John Adams and John and, and Thomas Jefferson having a break in their relationship. He's more traveled than perhaps any average American with eight transatlantic voyages by ship. Um, 
at least six weeks each way. His salary while in Russia was next to the president, James Madison, who appointed him given how expensive it was to keep up with the Russian courts and aristocracy. So I would be sitting across from a man who was nine years older than his own country that his father helped create and is profoundly accomplished due to his own intellect and gifts rather than his father being a former president. This is not a family wrapped up in nepotism. I'm sure it probably helped, but this doesn't really go down like that. Or being John Adams' son is what I mean. John Quincy Adams, usually the smartest man in the room, but never the life of the party. That's where his wife, Louisa, would come in. And thankfully, you know, otherwise, if she wasn't, he may have not have been as politically, probably wouldn't have been politically successful in any way without her. So why is he so focused on his work? outside of the normal 1800s, you know, you know, <laughs> brutal way of life. And why is he so focused on his diary, which he seems to be addicted to and seems more important to interacting with than his own family as his grandchild? Charles Francis Adams would recall him to be kind yet super distant, obsessed with his writing with ink stains on his fingers versus engaging with his grandchildren at the family estate called Peacefield in Quincy, Massachusetts. Um, which is also the you know where I'm is my hometown. So there's a, there's an there's an affection I have for this family and this time and place. So let's call that a very full intake and first session. We covered the debilitating grief about the current crisis that he's in about his daughter, some of his history, what he's like, how he presents in session. And remember, this is a ridiculous hypothetical that I've gathered from my readings and uh, me wanting to know more about his childhood. If you like this video, you can subscribe and hit some of the buttons, any buttons on the screen. If you're interested in doing some deeper work on childhood trauma, I run a monthly healing community, which is a membership subscription. What you get is you get access to all my e-course work. You get monthly journaling prompts on inner child work and childhood trauma. And you also get to attend two bi-monthly live Q&As with me answering questions about childhood trauma. You just go right to the link right up here. You can get the link and just sign right up. So this is a very different video from what I usually do, and it comes from my love of history. I love books about World War II, U.S. history, some art history, music history, science history, world history. And I find this, for me, I kind of get this, this calmness from drawing connections of human behavior or experiences through time. When I read or hear about the fact that Socrates had a very, code, he was a very codependent person in marriage where his wife was extremely abusive to him. And I get this little breath of space or this chagrin to myself that we've been struggling as a species with mental health issues for a very long time. And from the get go, but in progress is pretty slow, unfortunately. There's progress, but it's slow. You know, in a weird way, history helps me emotionally when I'm personally struggling in my present and I'm reading history and I find I just get all these, this breath or calmness when I realize in our politics or the state of the world that we've, we've been to places before. Like it might feel like the world is on fire, but the world has been on fire for a very long time. And I'm not dismissing problems in the present. I'm just explaining my love of history and what it kind of does for me. I also love revolutionary war history and being from Boston, Quincy, Massachusetts specifically, where the story of our president to be this client that walks into my St. Petersburg office starts. If you're not familiar, John Adams is a political philosophy giant and the second president of the United States. We're talking about John Quincy's father. First vice president serving eight years under George Washington. He's an envoy to France, Netherlands, and Britain. He's a Massachusetts delegate to the Continental Congress. And if you think about rebel alliance versus the evil empire, which would be the British. And he's part of that whole revolutionary takedown of that colonial superpower against, against them, the, the colony. So, and John Quincy Adams being his, the eldest son and the sixth president to be of the United States, also serving as in later in life as a secretary of state as a senator, a congressman, minister to Russia, minister to England. And John Quincy is the architect of the Monroe Doctrine, um, a, a diplomatic you know, foreign affairs policy of the United States while as secretary of state. And his work also led to signing treaties, ending wars with the Treaty of Ghent. One treaty he signed with the, the Onus Adams Treaty, which led to Spain giving up essentially um, everything from southwest, a little chunk of Florida, all the way to California 
all that land was given to the U.S. through that treaty, through his work. And I'm presenting this as a timeline here. I'm not creating a narrative around celebrating the U.S. as a noble, righteous country, shunning globalization in the Monroe Doctrine, or selling something like Manifest Destiny to you in this thing. Um, becoming the U.S. is a nasty business that involved taking lands from indigenous people, strong arming other countries and enslaving Africans. Just want to be clear here, like there's not not our old school history that we learned in grammar school. So both Adam's men have extensive accomplishments as political representatives, lawyers, and foreign affairs with their work in early American diplomacy. Their presidencies, though, are usually seen as bummers or failures, uh, but their careers are way more than holding that office for both of them. And one could argue that their brusque-like personalities are what led to them both being one-term presidents, not being able to get out of their own ways interpersonally, like I mentioned. It's gonna be wrapped up in this trauma story here. So for some timeline context, there was Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Jimmy Madison, James Monroe, and then John Quincy Adams. One of these things is not like the other, as you know, John Quincy Adams ends the error of founding fathers as presidents. In a new generation goes forward, he, and his father are the only presidents thus far that didn't own slaves. John Quincy had servants, but he didn't own them. They are known as Northern abolitionists for the time period. Just both of them had their own error-specific racism going on, such that John Quincy Adams didn't believe, um, he didn't believe in slavery, but he also didn't believe in mixes racing. So, so these two presidents, father and son, and all of this historical activity and governmental work that they're involved in, in both kind of like forging and keeping a new nation afloat. You can't look at who they are as individuals without including both of their wives as historical figures in their own right. Abigail Adams, wife of John Adams and mother to John Quincy Adams, um, and Louisa Catherine Adams, the wife to John Quincy and the first lady of foreign birth. She was she was British, the only other first lady of born of foreign birth um, next to Melania Trump. So Abigail is an incredibly fascinating figure who can be seen as the first line of American women's rights advocates. And she's also at the epicenter of American revolutionary politics. One could look at Louisa Catherine Adams as the olive oil to John Quincy Adams' vinegar-like personality. And and he wouldn't have been the public figure that he was were it not for his wife's social contributions in campaigning for him in the presence in Washington at the time and abroad. So I think one can surmise what happened to John Quincy Adams in his childhood trauma through how he struggles as a husband to Louisa, how he struggles as a father to their children, how he struggles even with coworkers. You know, they both seem to both, you know, Louisa and John Quincy Adams both seem to suffer some CPTSD as we know it now. So for more context, this New England family, a political and historical dynasty, takes takes us through our history in the U.S. Um, from the Boston Massacre in 1770, where John Quincy Adams was just three years old and living a few steps away from when that violent act took place, with his father representing the British soldiers in their trial, breaking step with his own countrymen at a very tense time. And that experience, and through the years of John Quincy's work in Congress, gradually dismantling something called the gag rule, which this, I wasn't aware of this, kind of blew my mind. It's a period in time in our history in Congress that it was forbidden to legislate, bring up, or discuss slavery in any way from 1836 to 1844, with John Quincy passing away shortly after that achievement of his work, gradually dismantling that when he passed away in 1848. So literally, he died in the U.S. Capitol on the job in his lifelong addiction to work. And as a side note, when we look at how children are influenced by their parents of these both remarkable presidents, they had a tendency to rub allies and family the wrong way. So this is complicated. So more about their personalities of these two men, John Adams defending the British soldiers as a local with having rebel friends or sympathizers all kind of around him and his family, including Sam Adams, which was his cousin, and is taking a huge risk. But he took that risk kind of based on this admirable, principled quality to him. But at the time, you might be looking at him going like, what are you doing, you know? 
and John Quincy would experience a similar kind of personality quirk, which is he broke with his own party in support of a trade embargo, which led him to changing political parties and alienating his you know, constituency in the North, which they suffered economically at that embargo. It's a little bit tricky to explain, but it's a little bit like they felt like they, that he stabbed him in the back on his principles. On one hand, we could celebrate these men for sticking to their guns, but there were times where you probably just wanted to shake them about being way too rigid, way too principled. I kind of see that as a childhood trauma symptom. It's like the idea of like, do you want to be effective or do you want to be right? So you can have someone who's having a lot of self-righteousness and grandstanding, egoic behavior. We'll see that with John Adams. But they're claiming it's all on based on principle, meaning John Quincy Adams had this habit of he would be waiting for appointments and people to nominate him, but he would never self-promote himself um, in a way that was just like that too principled. And it, it drove Louisa kind of crazy in when she was campaigning for him in his presidency. It's like he wouldn't advocate for himself from this rigid moralistic place. This is what I mean about how they couldn't get out of their own way at times. And I'm not saying they didn't make the right choices in their work or their, their political histories. I'm saying that their reasoning isn't always about the principle. And we'll see that later with John Quincy being miserable in St. Petersburg. So anyway, with these two men, we have approximately 80 years of constant historical political work um, ranging from the Revolutionary War all the way up into the period of time which was leading to the country slipping into civil war. And that civil war finally erupted just 13 years after John Quincy's passing. For some historical context, both Lincoln and Adams, John Quincy Adams, served in the 30th Congress with just three months of overlap before John Quincy's passing in 1848. While they weren't connected, Lincoln's ideas and politics would have lined up with the frail and sleepy John Quincy, who was 80 at the time, frail yet still working in Congress. And as a side note, we get a window into all this stuff and we're profoundly gifted by this family preserving their letters to each other through these years or through their pretty much their entire lives from the courtship of John Adams to Abigail all the way through the passing and beyond of John Quincy Adams. So that's them. That's the context of um, their contributions, the timelines, like their impact. But we also have a seat at their kitchen table from these letters, and we go back in time, and we witness what I believe to be still everything that we struggle with in modern marriage and family life with just different variations. All the same problems are just kind of repeating themselves indifferently. There is some progress, but we'll see the trauma, the gender roles, the power around gender in this family, power itself. We'll see ego, we'll see mental health issues, we'll see parenting issues, we'll see attachment issues, we'll see some internal misogyny, a long drawn out disagreements and misery in an intimate marriage, and the reasons why we suffer in relationships through looking at childhood trauma and attachment. So, okay, so if you're not, if you're not asleep yet, and if history isn't really, if history is kind of your thing, let's go back to the sessions with John Quincy Adams. So let's come back to that question, what happens to men? When John Quincy comes to see me in St. Petersburg in 1812, he's lost in crisis, but outside of a crisis, He's really disconnected from his emotions, his wife, his children, and he loses himself in his public work. And like it or not, he's into this, this world of being politically visible. So I'm waiting for the next session, and let's say John Quincy Adams is too busy and he needs to reschedule something about meeting with the Tsar Alexander. And he brings, in, he would never do this, but he brings in a case full of letters for me to read to catch me up. He wants to be diligent, but doesn't want to lose the time to therapy or connecting with me. I'm this, I'm, this is ridiculous, but I'm just, I'm just go <laughs> work with me on this. I'm annoyed, but I, I have this time machine and I speed read through the letters. And what else am I going to do as an American therapist in St. Petersburg in 1812? <laughs> as I'm reading the letters, I come across a 33-year-old letter that's dated from February 20th, 1779. And I think, wow, this is like four years into our eight-year revolutionary war against Britain. 
right in the middle of that. It's a letter from John Quincy to his mother, Abigail, who's in Quincy, Massachusetts. The letter is from France, where John Quincy is with his father. And the 11-year-old John Quincy Adams writes his mother, My papa cannot write but very little because he has so many things to think of. And when you receive them, you complain, and it really hurts him. So John Quincy Adams is wrapped up in a transatlantic fight between his parents over communication, intimacy, and the usual childhood trauma triggers going on for the adults about the human need to be seen. That's what I interpret that fight to be about in those letters exchange. For background, Abigail Adams had sent an emotionally charged letter to her husband, John Adams, about his lack of writing her, especially considering the stress of her maintaining like a homestead alone in Quincy, the country being at war, um, things happening in New England and not hearing from him about himself or the welfare of their son as they were in, in France working for the American cause. And John Adams fires back kind of a never talk to me like that again kind of letter from this place of you have no idea what it's like for me to keeping the, the American ship afloat in France while dealing with the immoral Ben Franklin uh, that he's working with. It's all very stressful. So I see this argument in maybe 95% of modern partnerships or marriages or whatever around intimacy and fighting to be seen from this lack of intimacy, whether it's 1799 or 2023, like you have no idea what it's like for me, go sleep on the couch is the vibe that we're experiencing. So what is concerning about this exchange is what really got me zero in. This is what started the whole project, reading this like, oh my God, is that John Adams has John Quincy, his son, who's 11, who's his secretary, write out that letter to his, his wife, John, you know, John Quincy Adams' mother. But then John Adams, you know, encouraged him to write his own letter, shaming the mother for her behavior. The letter that I just read to you is that letter. You know what I mean? Like, why are you, why are you doing this to dad? So I, I want to make a mental note here. If you've, if you've heard me say things like, how our parents handle their marriage and treat each other becomes our own blueprint for what to go on in our own marriages. That blueprint is contempt forbids to connect because work comes first and how dare you. So we know now in better mental health, we know that letter to his mother, That's we know that to be triangulation with John Adams getting an ally in his son against his wife who happens to be the boy's mother. We also can name it as parentification with John Quincy Adams soothing his father's mood. It's an important piece here. John Adams has a reputation for an intensely vexed mood. Some historians wondered if he suffered from being bipolar type two, as we, we get writings from Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin describing him as quite mad at times and totally out of his senses. And his son would actually be the, the better diplomat, but probably influenced by that intensity of his father, being triggered by his father. You know what I mean? Like we, we all know as trauma survivors what it's like to have a parent with kind of an unhinged mood. It's a major factor in this stuff. So to put the fight in context, Abigail hadn't seen her son or her husband for over a year was isolated and having the daily struggle of her country at war and the men in her life gone and not hearing anything. And I wonder what it was like to get that letter from her 11-year-old son who was shaming her in support of the victimized father. Many childhood trauma survivors are drawn up into the parental fighting, which really has a lasting damaging impact because you're forced to choose a parent over the other and you're brought up into the adult's business and losing, you know, your own personal stuff, which is your childhood innocence. As a side note, too, when parents do that, they're also teaching them to have contempt for the opposite gender, which is, I think, some it's a theme that we see. I mean, it's error specific. Women didn't have a lot of power back then, but there's more to it than that. So I believe Abigail you know, in, in later letters would apologize for that letter and the matter was dropped, but it's a window into this intimate conflict in a dysfunctional family despite this stressful historical circumstance. It doesn't seem like this kind of triangulation is a theme in that three-person family, but it is a moment telling you of a bigger story around intimacy and connecting and taking the last priority with service work and work itself taking the first priority.
It's also a clue where John Quincy learns to dismiss others in context of being on a mission, especially later with his wife, Louisa, and his children. So don't think of that lone letter from France as the one defining traumatic moment for John Quincy Adams. It's just a little bit of evidence in the day-to-day -day life of families that really shape us as children. You know, John Adams modeled for John Quincy stuff like the world is against me. So I read on in my St. Petersburg office in this bunch of letters, and I read about more events that John Quincy would go through before that letter took place. Related to the letter just a year prior from it, almost to the date, on February 13, 1778, very cold, blustery day in my hometown of Quincy, Massachusetts, John Quincy Adams said goodbye to his mother, his siblings Nabby, brothers Charles and Thomas, for their journey to France with John Adams. He went solo with his dad. They got to France after witnessing death and threat of death several times on the ship that they took called the Boston Over. It was a disaster. And when they get to France, they realize that French support had already been won by the American coalition already there. And the father and son would stay and educate themselves. They're now in France. Like, what are you going to do? But they return in August of 1779, where John Quincy's now 12. And as a side note, possibly Part of John Adams' mood issues from France are his impatience, the French confusing him for his cousin Samuel Adams. The French looked at the Americans like we were this larger-than-life Western figures. And it's funny that Ben Franklin, if you've heard stories of him wearing a coonskin cat, Ben Franklin was playing into that almost like celebrity quality. And in my mind, children are extremely in tune with their parents' moods and their strife in life. I remember that. I don't know if you do, but we now know that healthy parenting involves protecting children from adult issues. But with these dynamics of that letter and simply John Quincy being in France, there's no protection from his father's moods, his feelings of like being persecuted because he's that kind of guy, you know? So John Adams is recalled by Congress and Adams decides to go home, you know, back across the Atlantic, feeling pained by Franklin staying on. So his ego is pretty bruised. And I, I read on, and just four months later, in a kind of a bizarre turn, the Continental Congress had elected John Adams to be back in France as the lead minister. Um, and he goes back in October of that year. And he wanted the position, and his father and son go along again. But this time they take the little brother, Charles, who's age nine, and they all go across the Atlantic second trip. Charles is the third child and needs time and attention with his father, but he'd be placed with a, in a boarding school. It's more of this stuff around 18th century attachment or the attachment in this family, and we'll come back to this later. John Quincy would not return to his family again from the ages of 12 to 18, six years of separation from his mother, his siblings, and even separated from his father for the most time of it. In the early 1800s, it was common for children to be placed with other family while parents worked on other things. In several generations of Adam's children, there's these long periods of separation, even between the adults. It's, it's the issues that I really want to focus in on here in this project. So just because something is culturally common and era-specific for the time doesn't mean that it's not damaging to mental health and things like attachment. So back to John Quincy, imagine being separated from your family for that long, yet being called to this like juggernaut of a perfect little adult. Like many present-based childhood trauma survivors, John Quincy actually might struggle with being a tween or a teen because since a young age, he is praised for being the strong, stoic, intelligent, resilient. A lot of people have a, a hard time with that word resilient, little adult. Coming back to that question, what happens to men? So I read more letters and I read back even earlier in John Quincy's life before the trip to France. By that time in his life, the boy had already experienced living in war with a rebel father, meaning John Adams would be hanged by the British if they caught him. And I often find it miraculous that he wasn't, given how much he traveled to Philadelphia before he would go to Europe. Many trips. It's amazing how he didn't get captured. And his children were actually aware of this and terrified, especially Thomas, who was the youngest. John Quincy Adams also being in charge as the oldest male of the house in support of his mother, Abigail. There's that pressure to be an adult and that he would certainly take on and rise to that. And that's nothing really wrong with all that, but also the fear of like you're living in the kind of the wilderness at war. Um, not exactly the wilderness, but it's not a modern society. They lived through a pandemic of smallpox 
and they inoculated themselves. That was Abigail's choice, along with things like blockades, sort of a tense lockdown during the siege of Boston by the British, where the British took control over you know, the whole area for a year after the battles of Lexington and Concord. And at age seven, he'd watch the Battle of Bunker Hill from an elevation on the Braintree Quincy line. And he'd witnessed the loss in that watching that. Um, the family doctor, Dr. Warren, who saved his fractured finger from amputation when he was smaller, um, that man would die in that battle. And John Quincy would remember that loss or that realization of people die for the rest of his life. I think children remember these things those moments when they start to realize the world isn't as safe as you think it is. And around seven and eight during all that, also the age when Abigail took the immense risk of inoculating all her children from smallpox, death from smallpox was around 14% of the population with only 2% dying for those who received inoculation. To add in context of all that, before the scary voyage to France, his father was mostly absent due to his work in Philadelphia as a founding father and as a lawyer before that. So his childhood involves witnessing this wing in a prayer violent struggle for independence in what war brings to a community. Imagine, for context in our modern life, imagine being seven and in the middle of our recent global pandemic, but your community is at war with your government and your father is making these long secretive trips to Philadelphia. No email, no text, the only letters if they make it to you. That's the only news that you go by. So not knowing if he was safe or when you would see him again or the stress of going on for your mother who was this pillar of the community back then. Then there's that first Atlantic crossing with his father on the on the ship, the Boston in 1778 at the age of 10. The letter happens when he's 11. The second trip happens when he's 12. Seasickness, storms, a thunderbolt hitting four men on the deck of one of whom died. The mass getting hit by lightning and damaged. A British merchant ship that fired on the Boston and later a cannon explosion that took off the leg of an officer who died two weeks later on deck. He lived for two weeks on that ship in agony with John Quincy aboard. John Quincy would have a profound memory of the officer's burial at sea. And John Adams would write to Abigail that John Quincy Adams took it all in a very manly manner. When we think of all that happens to children who become men is that for ages we've been describing boys in this way, but we're really praising them for just repressing their right-sized appropriate feelings. And I imagine that many boys going through something like all that would break down if they were with a safe enough adult to kind of do so. Any parent who's had a kindergartner that seems kind of fine in the pickup line, but then breaks down with you in private in the back seat when they when it kind of catches up to them would know what I mean in this. And so while Abigail was the matriarch and the glue of that family, I don't know if she would have been really that safe for an 11 year old to break down in front of her. You know, maybe for a younger child, sure, but she also adds to this enormous amount of pressure about his studies, his being a little adult, his conduct, his family honor. On the voyage, John Quincy might have been hearing his mother's words, the departing words for him on that trip on the Boston, that first trip is, never disgrace your mother and behave worthily of your father. Abigail was worried that he was going to be become corrupted by being on the continent of Europe and France and worried about that kind of stuff. In rigid families or dysfunctional families, parents are often more caught up in the potential shame of disgrace without knowing what kind of child they really, really had. And Abigail will also go on to later write that she devoted him to the public, where there's kind of more sacrifice there. While being a teen in Europe, um, I believe, you know, after this, the second trip, John Quincy Williams would experience what I call to be shame attacks as a teenager if he was enjoying himself too much or going to plays or going on walks too much. And he would have this lifetime habit of deep self-criticism, not working hard enough, not doing his daily diary enough, not understanding antiquity enough. He was under constant parental pressure which became his kind of self-imposed perfectionism later. You can tell from these letters or the, the history that John Quincy Adams, his parents loved him, but they also kept him in kind of a vigilant state on doing the right thing in the service to others. But I've had many clients who are expected to be perfect and the parents never fully picking up on that they really had a good kid in front of them. It's a way to not feel seen and to not know yourself, but also 
fight reputation too much. They only saw the potential disaster of what the child might bring on to themselves or the family name. And this is clear what happens to John Quincy, um, what happens to his brother Charles, which I'll talk about later. Um, the pressure to study was not something I think a normal 11-year-old at many different eras could sort of take. So if you remember, <laughs> you know, summer reading list when you were in grammar school, John Quincy was the, probably the type of kid who would have jumped ahead two or three years to the older kids list and berate himself for not making more of his time, not, not doing it well enough. So on the second trip to Europe with this with Charles now in tow, the, the younger brother, not the baby third child, um, they finally get to France and John Quincy is, they're kind of welcomed into this wonderful, you know, you know educational, cultural world. He's an incredible student and he's absorbing French and he's placed in a boarding school after a few weeks, just after getting there. John Quincy thrives and Charles, who is just nine, is profoundly homesick and probably to the annoyance of his father is sent home two years later unaccompanied back to Boston, back to Quincy on a ship alone. That says a lot about the family's idea of like toughness and desperation and attachment. And again, I know it's the error. There's, there's a lot of choices that need to be made because they don't have the conveniences of, of what we have now. So I read more letters. I have the time machine, so I blast through them. And I'm noting these big pieces in John Quincy Adams' timeline. John Quincy is apprenticed, like I said, to Francis Dana at the age of 14 to go to St. Petersburg as a secretary to him, as a diplomat. He returns from Europe and Russia at the age of 18 to go to Harvard. And he graduates just kind of after a year and a half, given his prior education in Europe. He works as a lawyer in Boston on the North Shore, falls madly in love with a woman named Mary Fraser, but has to give up courting her, knowing his parents wouldn't approve given he wasn't financially ready. This really speaks to the control of the error, and this really breaks his spirit, and he would remember her for the rest of his life, you know, more sacrifice to service. His parents would be his main advisors in his life right up until their passing when he lost Abigail and later John when he was in his 50s. He was closer to them more than anyone in his life, which is kind of an oddity to me. Like one could argue that he doesn't fully individuate into his own person without them. And in my therapy practice in the present, given my work with childhood trauma, clients who are that intimately connected to their parents greatly struggle processing their childhood trauma they really kind of tend to choose their parents over their relationships or their own truth, which is kind of a theme to John Quincy. In his 20s, he gets into public office. He is later appointed back to Europe, specifically in England. He courts his wife or meets his wife there. She is a British-born daughter of an American merchant, and this is a rocky, complicated courtship. And later, the father, who is known in the, in the political U.S. sphere, goes bankrupt as a merchant and skips out on giving John Quincy Adams a dowry, and he flees back to America under the threat of a debtor's jail. But they still marry in 1797, and his wife, Louisa, would carry a lifelong shame. Think again about the reputation of your, you know, your family around that time and humiliation about the dowry. But John Quincy Adams never really falls her on it, to my knowledge, or kind of uses it as a against her. So they live as a diplomatic couple in Europe within, within several countries, and they have their first child, George, born to them in Berlin in 1801. Their second, John, is born in Quincy in 1803, and their third, Charles, is born in Boston in 1807. And I know I'm bouncing around, but in their marriage, they eventually return to the States, and their lives focus in Quincy as in Washington for his, his uh, political work. Um, and it's really a rocky start with John Quincy being cold, and greatly contemptuous of Louisa, who was raised in affluence. And she's like now burning cakes in Quincy <laughs> at the Braintree birthplace across the street from where Abigail took John Quincy to watch the Battle of Bunker Hill. Louisa is, you know, she's lovely. She suffers from low self-esteem. She's complicated. She has a lot of health issues. She's not welcome into the Adams family for many reasons and is treated with contempt at first by Abigail. Sort of like she's not this sturdy... New Englander woman with a good constitution kind of thing. Louisa would suffer from an unknown medical condition that in modern terms to me sounds like an autoimmune disorder, fainting, fatigue, miscarriages, but she's also, she also would rally through her life when others would just kind of lay down and give up in this brutal existence. And one reason why is she becomes pregnant 
in their marriage 15 times and she miscarries nine. And she will only have one surviving child by the time of her passing. And it's, it's hard to get one's head around the suffering in, of, of her and their marriage and him with all of that going on. So John Quincy becomes a U.S. Senator in 1802, and he resigns in 1807 over the Embargo Act, which is the impressment of sailors, which would lead to the War of 1812. And in 1809, James Madison appoints John Quincy to St. Petersburg, where our story starts bringing us into the current loss of his infant daughter and his life unraveling in 1812. If you're still with me, keep thinking about that idea about what happens to men. So when John Quincy returns for another session with me after all this letter reading, I ask about his marriage. And he would tell me some difficult things like um, in 1812, the marriage is okay-ish, but with problems, like she spends too much, but she needs to spend too much as a wife of a diplomat around this uh, aristocratic court in Russia um, that tends to party a lot, like a lot of their life is wrapped up in, in the social sphere. His diplomatic work requires Louisa to be more social than he is. She's better at it. And he appreciates her sensibility to be able to connect with the court in Russia at that time, but he also resents her for it because it's kind of un-American. And I would be thinking hearing that, you can can have both things there. Think like cognitive dissonance and, and echoes of his parents' fights or the revolutionary kind of rhetoric against aristocracy. John Quincy would tell me that he loves his wife, Louisa, and I would believe him, but he might express that he can't really connect with her or be loving fully in person, but he can do so in letters. This is kind of a problem that I would be setting up as kind of like an intimacy goal with him. And the biggest piece that would really stick in my mind is when I would ask him about his marriage, he would tell me the biggest piece of tension was that when he took the appointment to St. Petersburg in 1809, it was very painful for Louisa because it was decided that their two boys, the oldest boys, George and John, aged eight and six, would stay with Abigail and Abigail's family, a woman named Mary Cranch. But this is where it gets hard, is... John Quincy Adams and Abigail Adams made that decision, and they didn't include Louisa in that decision. And Louisa would only hear about it before that they would be leaving for St. Petersburg, and she would hear about it from John Quincy Adams' brother, Thomas. So there's a lot to unpack there. I would read that as some internal misogyny on the behalf of Abigail Adams toward Louisa. I would look at how John Quincy Adams is more intimately in line with his mother against his wife, thinking back to that letter when he was 11 years old about triangulation. Here we see it again. And it's just, it's a lot to unpack. So in context, your husband and your mother-in-law don't include you on the conversation or the arrangements about your children. And while Abigail is a capable grandmother who wanted probably a full house around Peaceville Quincy, because now they're finally into retirement and they have some togetherness. She didn't value her daughter-in-law enough and still modeled that work comes before connection. You know, I'm sure there was also stuff about the trip being dangerous and I get all that, but there's that doesn't always line up later. So to me as a therapist, this feels disrespectful. This feels manipulative. This feels self-involved. It feels betraying because it really is. But families that are tricky, especially families that you know, take such actions from a place of we know what's best. Like, yes, the trip was dangerous, but I don't think that that's what this is all about. When John and Louisa would return from Russia in 1815 with the assignment to Britain, those two boys would finally join them in Britain. George was now 14 and John was now 12. And can you imagine the reunion? It just seems like to me like they were not maybe the family maybe not knowing what to do with each other now because there's so much time and distance. And the damage was kind of done. You know, the youngest Charles left the States when he was two, the baby who, who went with them to St. Petersburg. And he's now eight with two older brothers, and he's essentially meeting them for the first time. In that conversation, if I were to ask John Quincy uh, in this hypothetical therapy session, how he feels about all that, he'd most likely be able to express Louisa's heartache and not having her boys in her life. And that he'd, he'd also be giving me a narrative, though, that he most likely picked up from his own parents of the era. 
And that narrative would be, oh, what could be done? It is what it is. You know, like my mother had their best interest in heart and we needed to travel. It would be dangerous. And Louisa would gradually ex have to accept these truths. He might express regret, but I think he's lived his whole life kind of normalizing these sacrifices. And he also might go on to tell me that this wasn't really a new issue between the two of them, that when he was working in Washington before Russia, and Louisa was too ill or too annoyed, <laughs> too annoyed with him to travel together to Quincy, as they'd often do in the summer when Washington was kind of unbearable in terms of heat. He would tell me that she was furious with him one summer because he got an apartment away from the boys near Quincy so he could focus on work while the boys were fine with their grandmother at Quincy. And when Louisa heard of this, she was furious at him because the whole point of that summer was for them to all be connected and together with his boys in Quincy away from, you know, the influence of Washington or the work. So Louisa would later in life greatly regret not advocating to be with her boys through that six years. Her two sons, unfortunately, they would die of alcoholism. And as what research now tells us in mental health, it tells us that we know that addiction is born from pain. So it makes me think of these diplomatic families or military families where there was frequent frequent traveling, you know, uprooting in schools, different caretakers, lost kids getting lost in the cracks. Two things are true at the same time, meaning that some things do need to be done and they can also be though damaging to a child's development in those things. So what I mean by that is like the things that need to get done. Sometimes you just have to go to St. Petersburg, Russia, and I'm not, you know, I, I want to be kind of clear about that, so and an error specific. So Louisa wouldn't establish a good relationship with her in-laws, Abigail and John Adams, too much later in life. And she eventually, um, she would eventually have a connection with Abigail and, and it was it was pretty good. And she would also have a stronger one with the aging John Adams, who was like a great source of comfort to her later in life before his passing. And so far in these sessions with this historical figure, my brain doesn't normally work in symptoms or diagnosis like this, but rather focuses on someone's story as I'm doing in this video. If I had to describe John Quincy Adams to say a psychiatrist or somebody else, with you know, I would I would kind of be talking about him in this way. He's a 45 year old married professional, struggling with workaholism and dysthymia, consistent low grade depression, poor intimacy skills, introverted, eloquent, highly intelligent probably dismissive avoidant attachment style. He's rigid and neurotic around work. Um, he can engage at times in sort of some Machiavellianism, um, but I rule out cluster B personality disorders, which can be confused with CPTSD. And this is about that that decision to exclude Louisa from that decision about the boys. He displays a flight and shame-based survival strategies um, on the fight, flight, freeze kind of continuum. He has poor emotional insight of his impact on intimacy. I describe his CPTSD from childhood trauma and growing up in a looks good on paper family uh, with like a ships in the night kind of a family, um, experiencing both life and death situations, extreme stress, interpersonal conflict, error-based trauma, war, and sacrifice of connection for public service. Um, he's detached from his wife and his children and um, approaches them in kind of this that they should be perfect unto themselves and that they shouldn't need him. He's a good candidate for an antidepressive drug treatment and as well as EMDR and some couples therapy and some educational resources on parenting. Not to kind of be damning him with those things. It's not not what I mean with this. And as a therapy tool for exploring CPTSD in childhood, I would encourage John Quincy to work with me and put together a genogram. So here's one, what it might look like. On the left are the four children of John and Abigail Adams, with John Quincy and Yellow being placed on the right to outline his own nuclear family. He'd fit right in between Nabby and Charles in the sequence of children. The pinkish arrows are to point how John Quincy Adams is somewhat of the golden child or more valuable child compared to his three siblings, and I bet that they felt that. I'm not saying John and Abigail didn't love their other children, but he is the most focused on given their political dynasty. The H signifies a family theme is which all the males on this tree attended and graduated Harvard, and it was suggested to do so and pressured to do so to specifically practice law like the patriarch. Not a lot of room to individuate and become one's own natural person. Family rule is to be selfless, to be of service, and don't embarrass the family. 
on the lower row of children on the left and right, they would all pass away well before John Quincy. His sister Nabby dies when he's 46, his brother Charles when he's 33, his brother Thomas when he's 65. He would survive them all in a special kind of loneliness that would most likely cause anxiety to anybody. Just as tragically, John Quincy's daughter Louisa dies when he's 45, his son George dies from alcoholism, you know, or suicide. They look at it more like suicide when he is 63, when John Quincy is, and his son John dies four years later from alcoholism when John Quincy is 67. Only John Quincy's son Charles, who I believe was never fully separated from his mother for years like his brothers, lived beyond his parents and died at the age of 79 in 1886. The dotted pink lines of John Quincy Adams to his sons signify the distance, an emotional distance, which is different or the opposite of John Quincy and Adams having a focus on John Quincy. The A's on Charles, Thomas, and their nephews, their, you know, George and John are the, the nephews of Charles and Thomas, signify abandonment for their parental system. All four suffered from alcoholism and were separated from their parents for long periods of time and through those years. And John Quincy wouldn't become an alcoholic like them, but he would use his work as an addiction. What is alarming that the two uncles, along with the two nephews, met their premature deaths via alcoholism and their, their childhood share the generational thread of pressure to be as successful as John Quincy um, and on top of the disconnection from family. John Quincy wouldn't be fully involved as a father to his boys, but he would write them letters on how to study, how to behave. Um, there were problems that he would get really enraged at about their behavior. They were something he needed to tend to rather than really be a dad for or be a parent of. The brother of John Quincy Adams, Charles, he would go to Harvard and he was already drinking heavily and he was already rebelling. Like he ran naked through Harvard Yard when streaking was coming into fashion. John Quincy's son, George, would share with his uncle Charles the same kind of family F up role from John Quincy as Charles would from his father. You know what I mean? There's that family F up in both families. Charles would be dishonored by his father due to his drinking. And George's suicide ideation, I think, was wrapped up in trying to hide from his, hide his failures from John Quincy. Both men felt like they were profoundly disappointing to their fathers. Both John Adams and John Quincy would greatly later regret what happened to their sons suffering from alcoholism and mental health problems. So back to that question, what happens to men? What happens to men in that they struggle in family life from his boyhood in war all the way through the day that he passed, John Quincy is on a mission, I believe, for the greater good while neglecting and causing damage at home. Um, as his hypothetical therapist, I'd have this love-hate relationship with John Quincy Adams. He's bright enough to understand what his family might need but he can't bring himself to go there or tear himself away from his work. And I know that this is error specific. It may not be fair, but what happens to men? The love I had for John Quincy Adams is what he stands for. Like he advocates for the disadvantaged in politics. He tries to do what's right and often does. He's on the right side of history politically. He loathes Southern slaveholders in the U.S. He loathes the, the, the surf sharecropping stuff going on in Europe and the institution of slavery, but he's also a slave unto himself and his trauma responses. The hate part that I would have for him or, or dislike is that he can't get out of his own way. As his hypothetical therapist in St. Petersburg, if he valued our sessions and my counsel, he might ask me about something and want to know if he thinks, if I think he made a mistake. In 1811, a year and a half before he walked into my St. Petersburg office, President Madison nominated him for the Supreme Court. It would have meant a ticket out of Russia, a life of stability and steady income in Washington and a chance of more structure and connection with his family, I think. Would, I think it would have been better. But he turned it down and had another four years of nearly like kind of futile diplomatic work away from his children and stressing his marriage. He wanted to wait for something greater of more di diplomatic work. I think he wanted something a bit more sparklier, actually. But it stated he turned it down saying that Louisa was too ill to make the trip back, so would he better sort of stay put. But when the nomination for Secretary of State came in 1815, he took the job and he actually wasn't concerned for what was going on with Louisa. And it's funny, but Louisa then has this historical moment where John Quincy 
takes off to go do treaty work, I believe, in France. And then she needs to make the journey from St. Petersburg to France alone and does so in this wing and a prayer thing through Napoleonic raged Europe. And it's fascinating in a way that as we can look at Louisa as a CPTSD survivor, but what is mind blowing about what I, when I was reading about her is that I think she's so triggered in the, her marriage with John Quincy Adams that when he's actually gone, she actually doesn't struggle so much with self-esteem. I am not saying that John Quincy Adam is the reason for self-esteem. I just say there's kind of a phenomenon with childhood trauma survivors is that when we get away, away from a triggering person, we are so much more functioning. And I think that that's what kind of happens there because then when we return, it's like she loses her empowerment. So these are the issues that make you disappointed with John Quincy Adams. But given what happened to him as a child, I would be kind of saying, I, I kind of get it. You know, I would be frustrated with him and I'd be trying to like get him to get out of his own way. So to wrap this up, why am I invested in this specific history? Uh, well, I'm from Quincy, Massachusetts. Like I stated, my heart is there. The church that both of these presidents and their wives are buried in, the United First Parish, was something that I would pass by nearly in my daily life, not actually being in tune with the like the incredible history going on. Um, but when you're a kid in grammar school, those statues of historical figures can sometimes feel like grandparents or something like that, especially when you're not doing well at home. And behind that church was like my beloved first comic book store that I would go to. Um, my beloved drum teacher's shop with steps away from the birthplace of John and John Quincy Adams. This, these are salt box little houses where the same place where Louisa would be criticized for burning cakes early in her marriage and across the street where John Quincy Adams would watch the Battle of, Battle of Bunk, Bunker Hill. It's about an eighth of a mile down the street, I believe. Um, and it's also the places where Thomas would be devastated when his father, John Adams, wouldn't send him a letter, but his siblings would get one. Um, that drum store on Franklin Street in Quincy near the birthplace is the stone carn where Abigail took her children to watch that traumatically, the Battle of Bunker Hill. And, you know, when my own family, when I was going through my own crisis and falling apart at 18, I remember walking over to the Peace Field grounds, which is the Adams sort of like estate. And I remember breaking down with a girlfriend there or what just happened in my own life. Um, and as a boy, after we moved from Quincy to Weymouth, Massachusetts, I lived just a two second walk to the birthplace of Abigail Adams. So these are places that I would just kind of pass all the time. And so it's kind of a funny joke is like, you know, thinking about like, who's obsessed with who here? Am I obsessed with the Adams? Are they obsessed with me? <laughs> They're not obsessed with me. Um, but I think what's interesting about through time and coming back to that question about what happens to men, just as John Quincy and his brothers and his sons were not connected with their fathers or themselves, not fully safe to be themselves, caught up in a survival mode, caught up in their parents' marriage and difficulties and trauma, there I am in Quincy and Weymouth, caught up between my mother and my father, with my father and being way too aware of what was going on in their marriage and the mess of it all and not knowing how to connect exactly 200 years later. So progress is happening, but progress is slow. And I'm hoping in this, this video that men don't feel judged in this. And more to be more open at looking at what happened to them as children, what happens in our families in the last generations of, say, the last 200 years. Are we repeating things that our grandfathers were doing? You know, did they struggle with connecting with their children as well? And to wrap up, I'd like to express some deep gratitude for my friend Albert, who was gracious enough to chat with me and let me see the resting place of John Adams, John Quincy Adams, Louisa and Abigail underneath the United First Parish in Quincy. Um, if you're ever in Quincy in the downtown area, it's been totally renovated to highlight this family, to highlight the history. They've even changed the traffic around into a beautiful park. It's a wonderful place to visit. I highly recommend checking it out. Um, if I've gotten anything wrong in the history, please feel free to let me know. I probably have. I didn't actually read these letters. <laughs> I read some amazing books by academics and historians who read the letters, so things can get lost in translation there. Here are the books in order of how I'd recommend the reading to read about this fascinating family. Uh, the first up is Louisa Thomas's Louisa, The Extraordinary Life of Mrs. Adams. I recommend starting there with her wonderful book to get a window into the world of this remarkable woman while you get to know all about him as well because it's like she's taken through his life 
of his career. And you can see this woman displaying CPTSD symptoms and struggling and sort of and managing as best as she can in an extraordinary time. And, you know, going through it all. Next up is Fred Kaplan's John Quincy Adams, an American visionary. Um, very thorough, very well thought out, more historical timeline stuff than getting into the nitty gritty, like the emotional stuff like the Louisa Thomas book does. Then there is a book called Abigail Adams, Witness to the Revolution by Natalie Bober. Um, it's the letter in this book that she highlights that I zeroed it on that letter from, from John Quincy Adams to his mother. So all right, that's enough for me. I hope this was enjoyable to you. Um, I hope you found it interesting and thought-provoking. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be joyous. Take care, and I will see you next time. <laughs>